Hi, everybody. I'm Dawn Zoldai. I'm the CEO of P3 Tech Consulting, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to our panel today, our regulations on commercial drones panel. Uh, so before we get there, I just want to talk a little bit about background. Uh, I'm a 25-year Air Force veteran. I'm a licensed attorney, and I'm actually a current uh, federal employee as well. So because of that, I have to give the mandatory federal disclaimer that uh, the views I'm espousing today do not re represent those of the Department of Defense, the United States Air Force, United States Air Force Academy. I'm not uh, endorsing any particular federal agency or organization I'm talking to. And I'm certainly not trying to influence the actions or uh, of any federal agency or their employees, because we have a couple other ones on here with us. Uh, so with all of that, I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick around the room and let our amazing panelists introduce themselves. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and give it to David Uriel Ibarra. David, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much and hello everyone. Um, I'm David Uriel Ibarra. I am with the Federal Aviation Administration and I am the AFS 300 UAS Division Representative. Uh, currently, uh, one of my main focuses is actually advanced air mobility uh, as well as UAS Towered Operations uh, Subject Matter Expert. Thank you so much, David. We have another one of your colleagues, Ryan Alfonso. So Ryan, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ryan Alfonso. Uh, I work with uh, David uh, in AFS 300 FAA as the UAS coordinator and liaison. Uh, been in aviation for many, many years. Uh, bachelor's, master's degree from Embry-Riddle and, uh, and uh, eight years in the Army. So. Pleasure being here. All right, I was Air Force Sohua, you know, gotta appreciate our Army brethren over there. All right, now we're gonna go hand it over to Dr. Sarah Nilsson. Hi everyone, um, I'm Sarah Nilsson, and I have both an aviation and a legal, legal background. I have been a pilot since 1994 in fixed wing aircraft, um, holding an ATP, CFI and uh, double I and MEI and all that. Also a remote 107 pilot. In 2014, I started my legal career, State Bar of Arizona and opened my firm. And in 2015, I joined Embry-Riddle. So Ryan, go Eagles. And um, I'm an associate tenured professor there teaching aviation and drone law, global drone law as well. I also am an FAA safety team rep. So again, my views today are not the FAA's. They are my own personal views, even though I'm an FAA safety team rep. And I also am an Angel Flight West uh, command pilot because I wanted to put my Cherokee 235 to good use. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, we have Mary Caitlin Ray. Hi everyone, I'm a counsel in the aviation group at Kroll and Mooring in Washington, DC, where I advise drone operators and manufacturers on FAA regulatory matters, as well as commercial contract issues. I also represent business aviation clients in the sale, acquisition, and leasing of corporate aircraft, and on Part 91 and 135 operating rules. Prior to joining Kroll and Mooring, I was an attorney in the FAA's Office of the Chief Counsel, where I advise the NextGen and UAS program offices on procurement matters, including the UAS Integration Pilot Program, and I represented the agency in commercial disputes. I also currently serve on the Drone Responders Law and Policy Committee with our moderator, Dawn. Um, and as for my disclaimer, I'll, I'll note that um, none of my remarks today are intended to be legal advice. Um, if you have specific questions about um, you know, an operation or a product, you know, please, seek, um, please seek appropriate aviation counsel. All right, so that was our quick around the room. You can you can tell what an amazing dream team we have for this panel. So it's a real privilege to be the moderator today. And today we're going to focus on commercial drone use and policy, uh, with an emphasis on really providing you some practical information and tips. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with the basics. Uh, start at the beginning, focusing with Part 107. And I'd like to first talk a little bit about how part 107 facilitates commercial drone use and maybe even some of those drone for you know drones for good stories so let's start with you david what routine commercial use cases is the faa seeing since its inception in 2016 
Well, at this time, the FAA is seeing fast growth in industrial inspections, real estate and aerial photography, agriculture, insurance inspections, and government, which includes law enforcement, border surveillance, fire departments, and municipalities. But now the FAA is involved with the civil FAR Part 135 SUAS operation certifications that involves package deliveries. And more recently, the FAA, in collaboration with NASA, as well as other industry leaders, is involved with uh, urban air mobility, as we know, or advanced air mobility, uh, which I am the representative for at this time. And there's more information uh, that you could seek uh, on the NASA website. Well, thank you so much. You know, you raised uh, Part 135 package delivery. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in this session. Uh, but before we go there, sticking with Part 107, Ryan, I'm going to ask you this one. Of course, without any FAA endorsement of a particular private effort, I'm sure you're familiar with Drone Up's Operation Last Mile research. Uh, they used a university campus, if you recall, to test the limits of what could be done with a Part 107. Were you pleasantly surprised to see the expansive operations that that research team was able to pull off with just a standard Part 130, 107 license? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I am familiar with Drone Up's last mile research uh, on the campus of St. Paul's College in Lawrenceville, uh, Virginia. Uh, however, though, there are also uh, more research test beds as well. Uh, of course, the FAA is always happy to see all industry partners succeed and learn. Uh, aviation is a continual learning process, so seeing them and others learn, as we all do, is uh, always pleasant. Uh, currently, I sit with uh, the UAS uh, Integrated Pilot Program, IPP. Uh, these participants in the program test the practicalities of 107 and 135, and they too have been utilizing campuses to test and provide COVID age, uh, aid. Such companies like UPS Flight Forward, uh, they're performing 107 COVID-19 response routes in uh, North Carolina and Florida, and it's ongoing. Uh, Zipline, another one doing COVID-19 response Part 107 operations in Huntersville, uh, North Carolina. Yeah, so many people are doing great things. And, you know, again, sticking with our theme of providing practical information, I'd really encourage the viewers to go to DroneUp's website, check out their Operation Last Mile uh, report. And of course, the FAA has a website. We're going to talk a lot more about all the different functions they have on that website, but uh, it's chock full of practical information for Part 107 and some of the uses that are occurring right now. Transitioning over to Dr. Nilsson, uh, you know, as a pilot and as an attorney, both you have a unique perspective. Uh, so, in your experience, and you know, despite the Operation Last Mile experiment. What are some of the limitations you're still seeing with Part 107 that you have personally experienced? Yes, Dawn. Um, we've come a long way. I recall doing my first waiver for 107 for clients, and it took literally 10 months to get rolled out. And that's because of the constant back and forth and not knowing for sure what the FAA is seeking. After 2018, it got a lot easier because there was more transparency at the agency and we were able to get some good examples and some good support documents. And so now it goes faster, but there's still a few uh, limitations. Um, it, despite LANS, um, we have lots of zero grids still and those take a long time and there's a lot of back and forth with the application. Um, I think I'm really hopeful for the night and um, operations over people's waivers becoming actual regs because that's going to cut down on a lot of a lot of uh, different things. Um, in another perspective is perhaps a clearer. Um, I know that the FAA is trying to get the operator to consider all the hazards and do a risk analysis and whatnot, but maybe a more clearer, here's what we want you to do to help us help you kind of thing. So that's something that I still see rather than going back and forth, which takes a lot of time. And I'm sure it's not the most efficient way of doing things. You use an acronym, you know, being a former military, I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, you, you know, we'll probably have a very diverse crowd in our audience. So it, it was LANCE, and I know that's an FAA program. Uh, but do you, can, can one of you 
spell out what Lance is. I think I know, but I don't want to misspeak. I think I think we'll hand that over to Ryan. My memory, as as uh, you know, we we look around. My memory, it's the low altitude aircraft notification capability, and it's uh, it's a way for pilots to uh, drone pilots, small UAS, to uh, basically communicate, I guess, indirectly with. Uh, air traffic control, and also just to understand where they are in a particular airspace. Is that about right, Ryan? Yes, uh, Lance is exactly what you said. It's a UAS uh, data exchange. It's a low altitude authorization notification. Uh, it provides drone pilots with access to controlled airspace at or below 400 feet. It gives awareness uh, of where the pilots can, can and cannot fly. And it gives our professionals over at air traffic the visibility into when and where drones are operating. Yeah, so it's a critical system. And you also used another term, Sarah. I just want to, you said zero area on a UAS facility map. Can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Yes, absolutely. So the FAA has done a fantastic job of mapping with grids um, the entire country. So when you apply for a waiver, and you go to this UAS facility map, you're gonna see that the airspace, the controlled airspace is gridded and some of the grids have numbers in them and those numbers correspond to the maximum altitude at which you can fly your UAS. Some of those grids, however, have zero, meaning you can't fly in that sector. Going through Lance, meaning going through the app on your cell phone and going ahead and getting almost instantaneous within 30 seconds approval. And so in the zero grids, you still have to go through the old fashioned way of the drone zone portal, doing a paper application, if you would. I mean, it's electronic, but it's kind of the same. And then going back and forth and waiting um, a few weeks or even a month. So that's that's what I meant by the zero grid. And yes, some, some operators have to operate in that zero grid because of the nature of their work that they're doing. That, that is great information information between having to use the the portal you're mentioning and then the lance which is right on your phone so awesome mary caitlin so when a client comes to you and they're hamstrung maybe with some limitations some of the ones dr nilson just spoke about what's your next move you know what one of the first things that i discuss with clients is how important it is to choose a regulatory framework that's best suited to the mission and that will offer maximum flexibility and part of that calculus is understanding the limitations of your chosen legal framework, as, as Dr. Nelson um, just touched on. For example, only certain limitations of Part 107 can be overcome through the waiver process. Um, for example, nighttime, beyond visual line of sight, or BV loss, um, visual observer, multiple UAS, yielding right of way, operations over people, et cetera. So some operations are going to be well suited to straight Part 107 operations without the need to obtain a waiver, while others are going to you know, require one or more, more waivers, and still others are going to fall completely outside of the scope of Part 107 and will need to be conducted under Part 91, um, or for some of our newly minted drone delivery airlines uh, under Part 135. And part and parcel of this analysis is choosing an aircraft that fits both the mission in terms of technological capabilities and the legal framework. Um, and by this, I mean size and weight restrictions, um, you know, any anti-collision lighting that's required for, um, for nighttime operations, detect and avoid systems for operations that require beyond visual line of sight waiver, those kinds of things. Um, at the end of the day, these limitations are a part of the regulatory environment that commercial drone operators have to work within right now um, if they want to access the national airspace system, right? So I think the key is finding the path of least resistance that still allows the business to accomplish its mission. Mm -hmm.